Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome, welcome, welcome to the final in the series of the Festival of the, Co the Cloth, I'm sorry, panel discussion series. Um, we're so grateful that you could have joined us this morning. And I am going to hand over to our moderator who has so skillfully guided us over the past two weeks. And this morning she is looking as radiant as the sun. I anticipate that today is just going to be over the moon. So without further ado, let me hand over to Dr. Amina blackwood Meeks, and she will introduce to you our presenters for today. Today, Over to you, Dr. blackwood Meeks. Thank you very much, Sansia. Please allow me to call you that. Good morning, everyone. I am so pleased to see so many repeat visitors. Some persons have been with us since the very first uh, panel discussion. I am very, very honored to have been asked to do this by the JBDC. We have had, as Sansia mentioned, two very important first parts of this journey. We're not coming to the end of the journey. It's a three-part first part of the journey. And I am sure that by the end of this morning, we would have identified additional steps which need to be taken. I say additional steps because some steps have been identified in each of the other parts. So we started by looking at the spirit of culture and how it is manifested in textile designs. Last week, we looked at Jamaican hands and hearts embracing the cradle of the brand. And then today, we are going to be looking, having our discussions under the theme, Adira in a Yaba, moving forward. I'm going to use the word indefatigable to introduce our guest, because if it is one thing that we have identified so far, is that this is not a sprint. This is a long haul and it requires people who are indefatigable and who are willing to pursue it almost world without end. We want to look this morning at the lessons that we can adapt from the experience, from the Nigerian perspective. We want to look at what policy framework is needed and how we ensure growth and sustainability of the textile industry. I'm very pleased to welcome our panelists, Ms. Valerie Vieira, who is the CEO of the Jamaica Business Development Company. Uh, she is going to be guiding us through the importance of policy framework. And when I say this, I don't mean for us to have artificial demarcations of what the panelists will address because we are going to be cross fertilizing here. I'm very happy to be making the acquaintance of and to introduce to you the, the current Nigerian High Commissioner to Jamaica, Her Excellency, Dr. Maureen P. Tamuno. And we are going to be looking at what the relationship looks like between the two textile industries in our two nations and what the indications are for going forward. Mr. Vivian Crawford, the indefatigable executive director of the Institute of Jamaica is going to be walking us through the importance of documentation of our cultural assets and how that ties into what we want to be discussing here today. So thank you again, everyone for joining the panelists and the participants in the room. As always, we um, welcome your comments in the chat. And let me just tell you now that we're looking forward to having a very special surprise guest. I want to start with you, Mr. Crawford. And I want to start with you because you head an institution that is charged with a mandate related to how we curate and preserve and advance what we understand to be our cultural assets. So for those of us who have forgotten and those of us who have never heard, just tell us a little bit about the role of the Institute of Jamaica in this regard. If you would unmute. True born yes. Maroons are not accustomed to these countrymen. 
we specialize in their bank. Which, which is and was a high form of communications technology. Jamaica's first cell phone. Yes. <laughs> Madam Master of Ceremonies, Dr. Amina Blackwood Meeks, Your Excellency, Ms. Maureen Tamuno, Nigerian High Commissioner, Ms. Valrenita, CEO, Jamaica Business Development Corporation, Sir Harold Davis, Deputy Chief Executive Officer, Jamaica Business Development Corporation, Mr. Colin Porter, Manager Technical Services, Jamaica Business Development Corporation, members of staff, Yes, guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm so glad the Master of Ceremonies did not scold me for wearing this outfit on an occasion like this, because as a true born maroon, I should be in Makwaku ambushed, <laughs> not visible. So thank you, MC. It is my privilege, pleasure and duty to be associated with this endeavor which highlights the heritage of Jamaica. And I bring you greetings from the Institute of Jamaica, founded by Governor Sir Anthony Musgrave and whose wife must be numbered among the pioneers in promoting our textile lace bark as a cottage industry. I'm so glad I'm asked to speak about documentation because agencies of government such as the Institute of Jamaica, the National Library, the National Archives are priceless records of our heritage and patterns, patterns are waiting to be displayed on our new textile. I know the duration of my presentation is in keeping with my height. And I also know that brevity is the soul of wit, especially to those who lack eloquence. But I'm so excited about what the Jamaica Business Development Corporation is undertaking that I can hear Harold Davis singing, I come with this, I come, I may not want about the race, no. Not many Jamaicans are aware that we once had clothing, bonnets, tied slippers from the lace bark tree. And the botanist will want me to pronounce it la ghetto, la ghetto. Um, these are skills for making the cloth that our ancestors brought from Africa. And Dr. S um, Sir Hans Sloan, who was here in the 1690s, as doctor to the Duke of Albemarle in Port Royal, Dr. Sloan lived in Spanish town at uh, Monk Street. And in the 1690s, he promoted, when he returned to England, chocolate or cocoa to Cadbury, and the rest, of course, is history. But back to our lace bark, King Charles II was presented with the Jamaican lace bark as a cravat by the former governor, Sir Thomas Lynch, and the Royal Botanical Gardens, Q, the Royal Botanical Gardens, Q has a lace bark slippers from Jamaica on permanent display. And of course, in the British Museum in 2010 was an exhibition of 100 objects, 100 objects that they regarded as priceless for mankind and womankind. And of course, among the objects, the lace bark from Jamaica. Um, it was on show also at the 1891 exhibition trade show, um, which was held where Woolmers and the Michael are today. And the patron was Prince of Wales, um, Prince George. And he requested uh, doilies, little towel from the exhibition to be taken home for his mother. He was given it to Queen Alexandra. There are therefore opportunities for commercial use of what the Jamaica are trying to do and what your organizations are, are your organization is doing. And I therefore want to commend you for that because a commercial part of the cloth, the textiles that you will be developing um, is this craft of applique and people are just waiting to see on some of the outfits, the cocoa, the chocolate, 
think of it and the Jamaican endemic plants. I think of the Portlandia, a massive trees by the Institute of Jamaica. It was identified in Clarendon in 1753 and named after the Duchess of Portland, whose husband was governor of Jamaica. And after uh, and his son, their son, Titchfield, um, that high school is named after. So there are many opportunities to share in our skills based on the priceless documentation that we have. And we are aware as a country that by the end of the year, Port Royal will be the place where all roads will lead to. And there will be many, many opportunities for us to commercially develop what I have just mentioned. Because incidentally, on the way to Port Royal, there is a sign, not many persons notice it, that the first coconut tree mm -hmm. was planted along that road. Mm -hmm. So there are many opportunities. They, and I want to end by saying congratulations again to the organizers for this fabulous um, presentation. The past is history. The future is a mystery. What the present is a gift. That is why it is called a present. And we must congratulate and commend the Jamaica Business Development Corporation on, and all those responsible for this never to be forgotten endeavor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Crawford. You have, um, you know that you deserve a little chastisement for the outfit. Yes. And But I am going to forgive you this time for two reasons. One, because you promoted the CEO of the JBDC to Queen's Council. Um, she is Miss Valerie Vieira. And the second reason I'm going to forgive you is because I do not know what the lace bark tree is. And in case I don't, and in case there are people in the audience who also do not know, I would like you to walk us through that, please. Really? It's, 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 it's a large tree, which, um, um, as I said, um, it abounds in Africa and our ancestors brought it and the bark. It is the bark from it looks rather lacy. And that is what is used to make um, clothes. Um, our ancestors, remember, didn't have access to the shopping malls and they didn't, they were very, very skillful at it. And there is a permanent exhibition at it at the Institute of Jamaica. So it could be that we need to display it at a prominent spot where everybody can see it. Wow. Is there any place that we could see the tree? The tree is in the forest. Deforestation has affected it, uh, but it is still around. Okay. I Thank didn't know you. it would create so much excitement. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I am going to invite Miss Valerie Vieira at this point in time to do her overview. And Valerie, I want to provoke you um, in the way that Mr. Crawford has provoked me. Very often you and I have discussions about persons who will say, you know, I'm going to wear my African outfit like, like a juve morning <laughs> or is a costume. <laughs> And yes. I, was, I was struck by the way when Mr. Crawford mentioned the places that our fabrics have been, they were all in terms of British royalty. Yes. And I want to know if we never had any kinds of exchanges with ourselves and the continent in the past and how you respond to this. Well, first of all, um, I want to say that Mama Niki, from our first um, conversation, made it clear that we are all queens. So we are royalty, regardless of where we were born. And you know, I celebrate our queenly attire. And so, yes, and I've been to that museum queue and I've seen our items on display and I'm so proud to see Jamaica represented with all the historical facts that my maroon friend brought to the table. I know he's a walking historian. And um, I want to really, I think he introduced some of the things I wanted to say, Amina, as my sister out there. And it is that 
when we talk about this industry that we are teasing to give more um, support to, and maybe even give birth to, we're talking about two important concepts, which is business, business and sustainability. And before I even go any further, I want to say that the lace bark tree, we have really destroyed a lot of those trees because like many things, we didn't take it as important. So when people reap the bark, they did it in such a way that it killed the tree. And that is part of the problem. And this is when we talk about building the industry and sustainability, we have to go right back to base from the soil to see how we build on the resources as we go forward with the designs. Because we have to train people how to treat with that kind of situation. Because if you kill the tree, you kill, you're killing a big part of the industry. So, for us at JBDC, um, we talk about Jamaica business development. And in doing that, I want to say an important element for us is the entrepreneur. Because we don't want this to be a, a, a group of hobbyists, the people who say it's nice to do a design and we celebrate that piece of fabric. We're talking about building a business and we have to get into the minds of our, our clients, participants in the program, that they have to change the mindset to understand that if you're going to be talking about sustainability, you have to change your approach from being a hobbyist to a business person, an entrepreneur. It means that you're going to have to formalize that operation because there are many benefits within the system and JBDC is working and ensure that there's an ecosystem that nurtures, nurtures the entrepreneur. But we have to start the mindset that we're in business. We're not looking for charity. We're not looking for someone to celebrate the one piece of fabric that we did, but that we want to earn a living from the activity. And there are many things within the ecosystem that need to be addressed. One, we're talking about raw materials. We don't make textiles here, but we can make natural dyes. And if you recall, in our first conversation, we spoke about us in earlier days, indigo was a dye we exported. And now I hear just patches all around the place. So we did do some work since the first conversation and spoke back with the Ministry of Agriculture and with CASE in particular. Um, which is where one of our business centers are located, to see how we can get um, farmers engaged in really planting material at that level, which is our foundation space that makes it available for the industry. This is basic. We talk about the value chain and the supply chain. We have to build that in this ecosystem. So it's nurturing. This is a fertilizer for growth. So we have started talking about that. We have started talking with JIPA, for instance, because people need to protect their ideas. Whatever can be protected, it needs to be protected. So we have spoken and working closely with a JIPA to see how we can embrace and protect the designs that could come from our, our entrepreneurs. We have been talking with SRC and Scientific Research Council because again, we're talking about quality international market. We have to ensure that we are on the bottom with that and the Bureau of Standards. So we haven't sat down and we have been working at it, but the first conversation really pushed us into even um, more action to ensure these things are being built and strengthened into the ecosystem. We're talking about, and I know people normally put this at the front, but for us, it is after we have built the concept and the business model and the business canvas. And we talk about funding, which again is an important fertilizer. And we're talking not about funding, but about appropriate funding. And even recently, last week, I was at the launch of a program, which is um, an initiative out of our own ministry, working with Exim Bank and its small business, Jamaica National Small Business, for funding, which I don't think we have seen this for the longest while, 
of 4.75% um, loans available to productive, and that word is very important, productive enterprises, which is the group we're dealing with right here, this kind of industry that we are focused on in these conversations. So JBDC is ensuring that there is a framework in which the business concept can be developed. And of course, there is the craft policy, which passed through parliament two, two years, about two years, at least 18 months now, which again makes provision for the support to the development of, of this industry. So the ecosystem is critical. That's the job we are doing at JBDC Business Development Corporation but a big part of it is the entrepreneur, the mindset that comes to the table. And this is critical for us. We are convinced, and that's why we are so um, appreciative of the kind of support, technical support we have been getting from our Nigerian counterparts. And I know Her Excellency will speak about that. But we need to ensure that once that um, support is provided and has been provided, almost four years now, that we have a system in place, the ecosystem that ensure that there is sustainability in that process. We don't want to stop and start. We don't want to do one picture and it's on the wall. We want people to earn a living in a commercial activity. We're talking about tourism because we again see that it, it can be a part of the tourism sector and in fact is the real Jamaica we're talking about when we talk about this aspect of tourism and so this is what people come for even when they go to the larger properties it's because these small groups have developed in Jamaica with our vibes they have developed the spirit of Jamaica that attracts people to come to visit us there is then need to demystify this concept of research and again in JBDC we are looking how we can enhance some of the great work that um, our Maroon, my Maroon relative, Mr. Crawford spoke about before, how we can enhance some of that and really get people to see that these are sources of information. It's not somewhere you visit once in a lifetime. It's your source of inspiration. And we want to encourage more people to really do the research from that aspect while we do the research in terms of strengthening the ecosystem. So we are committed to it and we know that it's possible. We just want all of the hands on deck so we can move forward with the, with the process. So lots of things have been happening, but we need now the conversation is to move us to the next um, goalpost. And this is why we're so excited that we have had so much um, participation from our Nigerian counterparts, from people like Amina, my sister, Dr. Amina Mix, and, and I must thank Mr. Crawford also for really elevating me to a QC council because um, that's where I aspire to be. <laughs> so Mr. Maroon, friend of mine, um, we're so happy that we have you. And by the way, my very, very special and warm welcome to Her Excellency, who has joined us. And I know we're going to be working very closely together in the coming days. COVID won't stop us. We soon can meet each other in person. Yes, that's that's very welcome news that you have presented for us, Valerie, about the steps that you have taken. I know that in the last two sessions, persons had concern that we're dreaming and we're having another <laughs> talk shop. So oh, now we wake up to pursue the dream. I'm going to come back for you to, um, to, 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 to drill down, to build out some of those aspects of what I'm now going to be calling join up government in this, yes. in, in, in this policy, because it is clear, it is not somebody sitting behind a desk in one place to draft mm -hmm. something and see here it is. However, if you would allow me now to welcome Her Excellency and to ask you, uh, Her Excellency Maureen Tamuno, if you would tell us what, what are the, the policies that exist in Nigeria for governing the textile industry from which we might take some lessons. 
So um, thank you very much um, for the return. I'd like to um, acknowledge the presence of Alumi, Dara CDJP, Executive Officer at JBBC, Vivian Crawford, Executive Director Institute of Jamaica, Moderator Amina Blackwood, Mix, and all others that are in this Zoom meeting today. Um, well, you can see from where I'm dressed that I'm compliant. And um, that goes a long way to say that um, we try as much as possible in Nigeria to practice what we do say. And um, it's very interesting to be here. And um, I have had I have had the um, cause to see one of our top representatives um, in um, JBDC who had already come to see me. I want to commend um, the good work and the enormous work that you're doing in JBDC and to say that um, Nigeria is totally committed to it, like you can see from our TAC volunteers and uh, from our partnership with Jamaica. And I'm here, though I'm new, I want to assure you that I'll run with you all through. I was listening to um, the chief executive officer speak and she was talking about sustainability. Uh, before I go on to talking about policies and how we can get it sustained, we must look a little bit at the other history. Because you see, when we're able to look back, we'll be able to appreciate what we're doing. In Nigeria, for example, if you look at the past leaders we've had in Nigeria, you'll find out that most of them dress in a particular way. We have over 250 ethnic groups in, in, in Nigeria, and of course, three major um, ethnic groups that you all know, which is the Yoruba, the Igbo, and the Hausa. And the other ethnic group where I'm from, which is the fourth, which is the Ijo ethnic group. In all of these ethnic groups, we have a way in which we dress. We have a way in which we look. In the, the Hausa has a pattern in the dress, in the Babariga. Yorubas have the Igbo and Buba. And of course, the Igbos have the Kwewi kind of dressing. And in the Niger Delta, we have our own, which is the whole. Yesterday, if you saw me at my presentation, you see what the way I was dressed. You know, maybe you go to social media and Google and Google and you'll see that. I'm bringing this whole thing because it leads to the policy making. And one of the leaders, uh, in our country some years ago, when he came in as president, he ensured that we returned our culture back in the way we appear. And most of these cultures were handed over to us by our parents, by our forefathers, we learned how to do it at home. And we later translated it into, you know, commercial kind of um, thing, which today has become a big business in Nigeria. And the policy may not be written, but it appears by the way leaders dress. It's an unspoken policy. It's not written anywhere that every Nigerian must be dressed in this manner. But somehow, due to those leadership by examples appearing in our traditional ways, you know, they become role models for those that are coming behind them. And everybody wants to look like, you know, Mr. President. Today, the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, uh, His, His Excellency Muhammad Buhari, he goes to places, he travels around the continent and beyond, and he's dressed in the, in the Abada. We even have what we call senator wear. They are all created by things, by our local fabrics. And so we are very much involved in the aspect of making sure that the younger generation learn from the leaders, dress like the leaders are doing. And, and that is leadership by example is one of those things that the Jamaican leaders have to imbibe. They have to dress so that the younger ones coming after them will dress like them or will wear the same things that they wear because most of them see us as role models. And so it is important that I say that at this stage. Well, we're talking about policy. I would like to say that from the Nigerian's perspective, 
Our valuable experience and history cannot be eroded. And so I'll prefer some solutions or some advice to this uh, discourse today. And one of those advices will be to ensure that we encourage our cottage industries. Those cottage industries that produce the tie and dye fabric, you know, across the country here in Jamaica. And also make documentations. I was going through uh, internet to find out if there are things I can find about what is going on. I found out that there are no documentations. Before we go to talking about policy, we must document documentation and a lot of research has to be carried out in this regard. And of course, we should, we should not allow the knowledge to go in extinction. Rather, we should encourage the passing of this knowledge from generation to generation. So whatever we are doing in terms of policy, in terms of decision, we must, not, we must put it down in writing so that it will move from generation to generation. Then we must, like what we're doing, encourage workshops, you know, and most of the workshop could be through government sponsorship or it could be through private sector sponsorship. And I said it earlier, and I'll reiterate it, that there should be leadership by example. If we say in Jamaica, we want this entire and dye fabric to be, to be what we want it to be, because for you to make a big time business, it has to be known. People have to know it. People have to admire it. People have to believe in it. Already a lot of people, when they see the way they will dress, they stop you by, oh, they want to take photographs. We want it to be beyond photograph, like what the uh, chief executive was saying. We want it to become business. We don't want it to be a hobby. How do we get that done? We have to get that done by ensuring that we are stable, we are constant. It, it needs to be out there where people can find it. One of the things that make people choose anything they see is when they don't, when it is not available, it has to be available there for people to get it. The tie and dye fabric is one fabric that has evolved in Nigeria over time. You know, places where you find it in Nigeria, in Ibadan, in Shobo, in Surulere, there are things, if you see today in Nigeria, the tie and dye is even being made in different kind of fabrics. It's even made in the silk form of fabric. It's beautiful to wear. So for me, we need to encourage uh, the Jamaican uh, 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 government to ensure that, you know, if, whether they are written or they are unwritten, policies have to be, you know, formulated somehow, maybe in appearance, unspoken, like a few of us are here today, dressed in these attires. You know, a few of us are not, maybe for one reason or the other, but we have to deliberately put on these costumes, you know, and let people see us as role models. And then they will start looking for it. When they look for it, it will become, it will now, you know, metamorphose to uh, big quantities on demand. And then when there is demand, there needs to be supply. When there is a huge demand, we don't have to talk about it. The business just booms. And then we start making the kind of profit you know, for the cottage industries that we desire. I'll stop right here and put all the questions. Thank you very for much. now, thank you. And what a very complex environment in which all of this is to take place. Uh, persons have said repeatedly, not just in the forum that, that, that we've had um, before, but, but every so often in everyday conversation, you hear people say, but I won't look good in that. And then to require our leaders to be the role models of what we could look good in harks back to a reparation objective. You spoke about the return of our culture and the return to our culture. If we are not emancipated in our minds that who we are and how we look is sufficient and that we don't always have to pander to or take our cues from whatever is the global trend of the day is a very important part of how we move forward. So I want to, I want to ask Mr. Vivian Crawford because what we are suggesting Mr. Crawford is that education 
in the broadest sense of the word is part of this moving forward. I want to ask you to speak to the role of the IOJ in taking part in this aspect of the moving forward. Are you there, Mr. Crawford? You're speaking about the education. Yes. And uh, modesty does not allow me to share with you that Grace Kennedy last week, I don't know if you saw the lecture, the, the um, Institute was the guest lecturer and we spoke about the tangible and intangible heritage of Jamaica. And that is, in fact, that's the background I'm sharing. And that is now on YouTube. And in that lecture, the presenter spoke about the tangible and intangible heritage of Jamaica, how we are preserving, how we can um, share that knowledge. And also you spoke about the, um, the, the British Museum and our repatriation, that two objects were found. And I look forward to seeing these images in the applique on the outfits. They were found at Carpenter's Mountain in Southern Manchester, then part of Vere in 1792. Um, the Taino gods, our first ancestors, they worshiped these objects because that's what they knew. That's what they knew. And the objects, were taken to the British Museum in 1799. The Honorable Minister, Honorable Olivia Grange, has begun the process for the repatriation of the objects. What my continuing regret though, MC, and I'm so glad you asked the question, and perhaps you shouldn't ask me. Children should not be doing history and heritage as an examination exercise. As you are aware, and as you have spoken over the years, heritage is a way of life. And I shock them. If it becomes a way of life, by the time you go into the exam, everybody will get 100% because you, that's one subject you over know. And I declare, as I said, as elsewhere, by the time I was nine years old, I knew everything I was to be known about my district. I knew where in, in, in Ghana Nani came from. I also knew, although I was nine, that there were Jamaicans in Nigeria, High Commissioner, um, Archdeacon Lennon, and there's a place they named after him. Um, he came from Moko. I also knew, knew that there was a, a gentleman in my, a pastor, who, uh, my godfather, Reverend W. A. Thompson, he was in Nigeria and so on and so on. So um, MC, the, as you have been doing, the more we share, the more we will know. Thank you. And, and, and you spoke about the records which are kept by the National Library of Jamaica, the IOJ, and of course the ACIJ, the African Caribbean Institute of Jamaica. I, I know that you narrowed it down to the role of the formal education system, but I want you to address the informal, the kind of join up that those oh. agencies can oh, do yeah. to what get people coming in to see what it is that we have documented and how that might impact how they oh. want to reflect Seeing it on their believing body. And where you are associated with the Edmund, the College of the Visual and Performing Arts, the Jamaica Cultural Development Commission, their activities abound. And um, as an extension to that, they used to have many, many years ago, and um, the Festival of the Villages, Portland started it. And out of that, you have these presentations about where we are, where we are coming from, and where we need to go. Wow. And there is the need for more of that. I'm afraid this, the, and, and that is good. The, the, could we say the, the performing arts, they, they are soaring. This, the, 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 our popular music boy, they have soared, they have, they run past us. And we need to catch up with them in terms of some of this oral history. We need to share that with the, with the people, wow. And what a big yeah. job, this job of mobilization is Valerie for the JBDC. What, what for example, are your current connections with JCDC so that 
You know how we used to have striped me salad and purple and whatever the other color was and some other things so that these popular forms of culture and the JCDC reaches every single Jamaican in every nook and cranny. It's amazing. What are the linkages that perhaps have already been established there or that you can envision to use popular culture to educate the people about who we are and the importance of this um, Adira in the Yaba? The year of the lace back. The yes. year of the lace back. <laughs> I like that, I like that, I like that, I like that. I like that. And the truth is that we, we are involved, we are working closely and collaborating with JCDC. So each year when they have the festival and so on, our team members are involved in fashion and in music, um, you know, throughout Jamaica. So we are there, we are involved with Vivian and his team. In fact, I was on one of his boards some time ago. I think though, I am, committed personally and as JBDC to the fact that we have to lead. We have to lead by example. And what I have noticed, and this might be a dangerous thing to say, but I believe it's true, that when we speak about the things um, Vivian spoke about, and I used to speak about all the time, my dear, the fact is that <laughs> They, it's, it's not nationally embraced in a certain way. A festival is for certain schools. Name brand don't especially go to festival. Let us be honest about it. Some of us who, you know, dress in our own way, sometimes I think we are the unusual or sort of challenge mentally in some ways or so on. We need to break those barriers. And as HC says, it has to be led from the top that our culture is a all of us thing. It's a Jamaican thing. It's not a some people thing. It's something that we should be living every day. It's not only to read in book and as Vivian said, take exam. Once you pass the exam, you're all right. It's supposed to be something that you wake up to. You live right through the day and you go to your bed with and you wake up again with it. It has to become the main part of our existence because whatever industry have, that's what we're selling. If it's our food, is the spice and the vibes that we're selling. If it is our tourism, rest assured what we're selling is the vibes of Jamaica. We need to pay homage to it. We need to embrace it in everything we do. This has to be our everyday thing, not a little component that we do once a year with the festivals and so on. It has to be our day-to-day -day existence. This is our soul. This is our bloodline. This is our heartbeat. And this is what we at JBDC want to infuse in all the industries that we are working with, mm -hmm. that the culture is the main ingredient. Perhaps. Our is the main ingredient yes perhaps we might consider um partnering teaming twinning i can't find the correct word at the moment particular designers with particular leaders in the community political leaders religious leaders yes so that you know this person is going to dress this person it would be good for the dresser and the dressee so yes. maybe that's one of the things you wanted to comment on that, Valerie? I just love that. I must tell you, we did some work out in Port Royal. I know COVID came, um, came in and put a little thing on it, but we had done some work with the help of um, our Nigerian experts in building out, um, they even have their own brand now, building out the history of, 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 of Port Royal seen it enough in the foods that they would prepare, et cetera, which would be traditional stuff. And I remember when our Minister of Culture, Minister of Culture, um, she went crazy when she saw the kind of textile that they had printed on the jewelry. And it was near independence. And I saw her all dressed up in it. And just what we spoke about a while ago is a fabulous idea that we should now see how we twin mm -hmm. our designers, 
with some lead people so that it becomes elevating to where we want it to be. Mm -hmm. I'm writing it down. I've written down list back here as well. So plenty of things are going on. We want to sell and cut into. But you know, again, we need to break that barrier because I think in the second, no, in the first, conversation we spoke about sand and cotton which is like our coffee the best in the world but it has some linkages to slavery and people have backed out of it but it is and it can be so we need to break some of those mental as you said we need to emancipate ourselves mm -hmm. and move forward mm -hmm. mr mr crawford there are some yes. comments in the chat which suggest you to my mind and suggest the IOJ and suggest a particular kind of relationship with the Ministry of Education. So it's a two part question. Someone is saying that they don't remember ever going to the IOJ, um, neither in primary school nor in secondary school. So that speaks to a kind of outreach that we need to have with the formal education system. That person is uh, a Jamaican. Is, pardon me? Where's that person calling from? Jamaica, sir. Jamaica. And the person is also um, wondering and or proposing that the IOJ could have mobile um, activities. So not we just- do, We do, sir. We do, okay. man. We do, chair. And that is the gift of the Japanese government. So we have, and even before that, we were going rural. Yes. So Has the- and, I, and tell that person, as a gift, I want that person to visit the Institute of Jamaica when COVID is over. Okay, so person, if you put your um your contact Tell details to for me. In, in, in the chat, we will also get that to Mr. Crawford. But Mr. Crawford, seriously, has one of the challenges been that the IOJ has not always been with the same ministry? Am I correct? That sometimes IOJ has not been what? With the same ministry consistently. Am I correct? No, but the mission is the same and the vision is the same. Okay. And the, we are going from 1879. It was established in 1879. You are aware, uh, you would have read that I joined the following day. <laughs> and quite a number of institutions came out of the Institute of Jamaica, Jamaica National Heritage Trust, what is now Jamaica Library Service. Um, the University of the West Indies, where the then executive director left his job to start the promotion for University of the West Indies, Sir Philip Sherlock. Who and I therefore, know? and therefore, a way has to be found to make all of those institutions sexy, if I can use that word, to make them seductive appealing, more and appealing. appealing. Yes, to make them more appealing. I raise the issue of the relationship with the schools because my experience has taught me that once our principals get fired up about something, then the entire school is going to move towards that something. And maybe they aren't fired up enough about bringing their students into the- well, We have children, we are, we are almost sold out. We have children before COVID, they are booking every day they are coming in okay. from all over Jamaica. And I hasten to tell you that I am from very deep rural, very, very deep rural. And I never forget, as a child, I was, we came on a truck. We did not bus those days. And we came on a truck and outing to Kingston. And I never forget going into this Institute of Jamaica. And guess what? It was exciting to me because it's the first time I was going in an upstairs building. The only upstairs I knew was to climb a tree. I now know, I now know MC, that that space which records all, so much about us next door was born, Mary C. Cole, who was, was regarded as one of the world's greatest nurses and uh, uh, for whom in 1919, a statue was unveiled at St. Thomas Hospital, Toronto. I also know that that very building where we are at 10 East Street, Prince William came with, and these are stories to put on the, on the cloth. Um, Prince William came with Lord Nelson. They lived at Fort Royal. Lord Nelson was too sick to return to England. Yes, when we go to Trafalgar Square, we look up and we say Lord Nelson, not knowing that when he came from Nicaragua, he was too sick to return to England. And Cuba Cornwallis in Port Royal, 
gave him a rub up and fix him up, restored him to perfect health. When he returned to England, he told Prince William about it. Prince William came back, came, not came back, returned, came with him to Jamaica. He too got a rub up. He stayed at what is now Institute of Jamaica. And fortuitously, that's the same gentleman who signed our abolition declaration in 1834. Mm -hmm. and, so there's and, a lot of, there is a lot of the lace, call it lace. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't it be amazing if part of the going forward would be a fashion show right there on the veranda wow, wow, of, wow. Um, of Mary Seacole House, go. which is now the arm, um, the NLJ. I would I want to go. It. And we should walk along. We should have the fashion show on this on the street on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. What about that? Yes. A midday Miss fashion Valerie show. Making, I see Miss Valerie making a note right there. And yes. you want the high commissioner? Veranda, you want the high commissioner? And, and Miss Valerie, that outfit you wear today has to be worn <laughs> again. On that occasion, I will come with my Kwaku bush in ambush. <laughs> That you should come it. with it every day. That's part <laughs> of what we're saying. That yeah. that and 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 I would like to go back to Her Excellency with this. That that so often we're treated as exotica, as a as a photo opportunity, and and we just look nice and people take a picture and hang it up on them wall. But that is about all they do. Perhaps. Perhaps we shouldn't so mind being treated as exotic and as a photo op. Perhaps the more photos they see, the more they will want to become a photo op themselves. Your Excellency. Hello? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, um, yeah, photo speaks, really. Photograph speaks. So I want to believe that, like I said earlier, we need to be out there. You know, we need to be out there, these fabrics, whether through photos, whether through, you know, being available. Availability is very important, you know, on whatever we plan to do or, or whatever JBDC plans to do or all of us collectively, we need to let these fabrics be out there because people are driven by what they see. You know, they, they, they tend to, you know, they tend to pick what is available. So if they go having in mind to see a photograph that I took with someone, you know, wearing a particular style and they get into the shop and they don't find it, another, they don't find it or another market, they may just pick what is available. So we have to, you know, be deliberate about what we actually want to do with these um, types and dye fabrics, these batik materials. It is very important for us to settle down, you know, not, not too much of talk shows anymore, but practicalizing what we need to do with these batiks, with these tie and dye. We can, I listened to the uh, previous conversations, you know, yes, the COVID season is here. Otherwise, one of the easiest ways of, you know, making people aware are through the fashion shows. We probably have to look downwards. Not ahead of talking about, yes, I talked about leadership by example, but it's also very important, like someone did mention, going to the grassroots, going to the parishes and catching it, you know, imbibing it into the younger ones, making them understand it right from home. You know, as they grow, they grow with the culture already, knowing that, oh, this is something that is theirs. They already know it, they're already looking like it. So it will be easy, you know, when they grow up to, you know, wear at once. We won't have the issues of, you know, trying to convince anyone. So while we're dealing with the top to bottom, we need to also deal with the bottom to top. So there has to be both approach so that while we're trying to do a lot of work convincing this generation that we're living in, the next generation will just walk into it. It is very important for us to look at that perspective too. Well, um, because what we're trying to do is, what we're trying to achieve, I believe, is how to have a sustainable drive and a sustainable means of um, expanding 
these um, cottage kind of um, industry into a mega industry, into an enterprise that will become a money spinner. And so we have to also look at how to combine these batiks, fabrics from other nations. You know, there should be what I call a fusion, maybe a fabric from the UK on this side, and then this batik on the other side. There has to be a combo, a collaboration, even in the fabric. So we need to look for designers that could, could piece it together. And then, you know, a lot of uh, people tend to believe that because we, you know, got these fabrics from our ancestors, there's this belief in our heads that, oh, it's for older people. It's for older people, you know, because, you know, but everybody forgets that he or she will be old someday, you know, so we need to modernize a little bit the designs to suit Jamaica. What suits Nigeria may not suit Jamaica. So we have to look at what Jamaica likes, the kind of way they like it to be made, and then we make it. They make the fabrics are made either in terms of color or in terms of style or in terms of the quality suit the market. That's what mm -hmm. I have to say. Yes, and you have been able to see this through your experience of Jamaica and through that experience to be able to identify the gaps in how we are raised and therefore the gaps in how we perceive ourselves. I want to ask you from the other point of view, in spite of what's available um, on, on, on the information technology on the net, what, what priority would you give to an exchange the other way around uh, now that we have the flights to, to, to Nigeria, to Jamaicans actually going there for workshops to see what happens, to see that this is not treated as exotica, et cetera. What, how would you feel about the exchange going the other way? What priority would you give it? Well, um, now that we have the flights, even though not regular yet, but we want to believe that um, in the nearest um, possible time we'll get that straightened out. Um, Jamaica has to, they, 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 they have to, Jamaica as, as a nation has to make deliberate efforts to visit Nigeria. You know, when you visit, you'll be able to appreciate what you're seeing on ground. Because in Nigeria, we have a lot of different demographics wearing these same fabrics we're talking about. We have the, the music physical people, you know us for the home video, the Nollywood program that they like. And you see some, we just finished, they just finished a program before I left Nigeria. It's called Flowers. It's talking about young ladies and stuff like that. You could see the, the costume, you know, being used. And so a lot of people struggle to want to dress like these artists. So when they come over there, they'll be able to see what is available in Nigeria and vice versa. We need, there has to be a twin kind of relationship. We need to put the colors out there. But one thing I appreciate in my short stay so far, which is about three weeks, not adequate enough for me to uh, speak author authoritatively by what I see, you know, or I can just assume because I've been to Montego Bay, yes, and Kingston, but looking at it, it's so similar to what is obtainable in Nigeria. And so I want to believe that fusing together will be very difficult. It's just like Nigeria. The only difference I have seen from my little, you know, knowledge in these few weeks I've spent is just the difference in the fact that our culture from Nigeria, it's a little bit, you know, different in terms of design, like I said earlier, in terms of design. And so, you know, this place is a tourist place. You don't expect a tourist who is going to, you know, to the beach to wear what myself and the master of ceremony is wearing at this moment, you know. So those costumes that could be worn likely to those areas could be made available. Something they could just throw over on their swimsuit or something. 
So I want us to, you know, uh, believe that this conversation will definitely take us to the next level by allowing the environment, you know, to, to, to express itself by the designs that we put out there. We are not the, the uh, I'm sure uh, JBDC, it's not the designer, but JBDC needs to work with certain designers in the bid of pushing their idea forward. So it's important that we look at designers from Nigeria, designers from Jamaica, and as quickly as possible, see what can be done so that we can get um, what um, they want to achieve. Maybe this is as good a time as any for us to introduce our, our very special guest whose, whose experience of Jamaica is beyond three weeks. The former Nigerian High Commissioner to Jamaica, Mrs. Janet Alyssa, is joining us now from Nigeria. I don't know what time of day or night it is. I don't know if we woke her up, but she's now stationed in Nigeria as director in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And she, in fact, was responsible for the placement of the two volunteers from Nigeria to JBDC. And we know we have been so impressed with her ardent support of the, the various ways in which the partnership between the two countries could proceed. So Her Excellency, Janet Alyssa, can I just see your face? And can I invite you to talk about uh, what it is that you experienced in Jamaica, which led to the initiation of the original project? Wow, this is this is so interesting and so wonderful to see all my sisters. Oh, brother, Vivian Crawford, what a man. <laughs> and of course, Lady Amina and Lady V. These ladies are always shining. You know, when I was leaving Jamaica and uh, a lot of people were like, oh, hope we can get someone like you, Janet. I said, well, the Bible says, pray for the leader you want. And I guess you all prayed and my sister Maureen arrived, boom. In <laughs> and uh, literally, so I'm so happy to be with you all. And uh, I'm really surprised. Collins, thank you so much for linking me up. And I saw a surprise, Lady Sweetney uh, is also part of you on the, on the board here. And I'm really, really honored. Well, the Jamaica I came in and the Jamaica I left were actually two different Jamaica. Honestly, I must say. When I came in, there was a lot of um, curiosity, very sure. And I do agree, yes. Uh, seeing me always in my attire, I stood out. And of course, my brothers, the Rastafarians were always uh, my queen. And I keep saying if an African could blush in a dark skin, I'll be <laughs> going that way. But I, I guess over the three years I was there, I saw a transformation. And um, I'm praying and hoping that uh, we keep it up. I do agree that history is not just something you, you teach in, in the schools and books and all that. If you, you need to leave history. You need to leave culture. If you don't live in the history and in the culture, it will just be something you pass by. And then when you leave that place, it moves. And one unique thing about Nigerians is that we may disagree about a lot of things, but we do agree about one thing, and that is our identity. Our identity is key to us. We, we like to embrace who we are. We have no apologies, I keep saying. Sometimes we may stand out to, to look as if we're arrogant. We're not arrogant. We're just proud of who we are. And we don't care what any other person has to tell us, but we know who we are and we are proud of that. And that identity is what has kept our culture going. Because like the High Excellency Maureen said, 250 ethnic groups, can you imagine if we do not keep the culture and the history going, we will literally be at war with ourselves because there'll be a lot of misgivings, a lot of stories of not being sure of what the other person is all about. 
but we've kept it going. We've appreciated ourselves. You will find someone from another culture in another person's attire. Why? Because I love the way Amina is dressed. And by the way, Amina, what you're wearing is typical for the middle belt of Nigeria, Benue, Kogi. This is very typical. This is their design. And I'm sure Alao will be able to explain further. So you, you find that when I look at certain uh, batik or, uh, or, or tie and dye, because there's a slight difference between the way batik is made and tie and dye is, uh, is done, you can easily tell where the person is from. Her Excellency Dr. Maureen, for example, what she's wearing is typical of the Southwest of Nigeria. So the same thing we are asking, and I do agree with Dr. Maureen that we need to have an identity in Jamaica. Yes, the technique has been reintroduced. I, I won't say thought, reintroduced because it was there before. We lost it somewhere along, so it's reintroduced. So just like we had in the in the metal walk when we were, I was so surprised, uh, Alao and uh, uh, Binda was teaching them a particular way. And before I knew it, the students were bringing in the, the Jamaican colors and I was like, hmm, I never saw such colors in Nigerian art and in, in, actually in metal. And they said, no, the students immediately brought in the Jamaican style and I was very pleased. So it's the same thing in the tie and dye. And I also want to agree that when the leaders, especially the leaders, the artists, when they embrace it, others will embrace it. Because when I see my president dressed in his traditional attire and he look good, or I see the president's wife, or I see the minister, or at my own level now, other the, the younger ones see me, and it goes, oh yes, this is this looks nice on her, and this looks nice on him, and then you emulate whether I would like it or not. There's peer pressure. Peer pressure is not only for teenagers. No way. Peer pressure goes all through. So if you want to really sell, this is it. And do not allow the, the whole design to be stuck in a particular way. And that's again why Nigeria is a bit different. You will find, uh, yes, it's a, it's, an, it's a print, for example, when, or it's tie and dye, but it's sewn in a jacket, like a suit. Because for the purpose the individual needs to use it is to be like a suit, like what uh, my Princess V is wearing, for example. <laughs> As usual, she always has a way of doing, you know, putting, putting it out in her own way. You get the fabric, like my uh, designer would say, they don't like to be called tailors anymore, they're now designers, that when you pick up an, a material, the material has to speak and the individual you're sewing the material for has to speak. So the two must marry each other. And that's what design is all about. I recall when we had uh, the joint program with um, uh, uh, under the Jamaican, uh, I think that was the fashion show. I was surprised with the, with the three Nigerian uh, designers when they came in and they were like, you know, the whole thing just, Jamaicans were able to just immediately accept that this is something they can quickly, and they wanted, everybody wanted to buy, but I was so sad that they were not willing because they were moving to another show and they needed the fabrics to move on. But if Jamaica had been the last event, they would have probably sold everything they had. And Jamaica as always, is always setting the tone for the Caribbean. So you mustn't lose this. You have, this is gold right now. You need to melt the gold and start to mold it in the way you want. Jamaica has come a long way. In the last three years I was there, a lot of changes. I attended so many events, parties where it's an African theme, fine. Now we need to start translating it. Businesses were booming. Business will get better if the people were. The people will understand where we, the leaders, understand and take it forward. It's a chain reaction. So we must take it as a chain. We have a role to play. And please, my brother Vivian, next time I need to see you in your kente or in your, in your print, whatever you are more comfortable with. So, you know, get, get allowed to make something for you immediately. So this, this, is, this is what I, lo I love to see. And um, this is the idea. And again, I always say something that the Nigerian in the Jamaican 
is bare. It's not, it, I think we are so, our, our blood is so thick in us that you can find that we are so similar in so many ways. And this is, this is it. We just need to come out and continue to explore and, and be confident because Jamaicans are very confident. But I just see there are some aspects like in the way we, we, we take culture, especially culture. We need to be bold in Jamaica about our culture as Jamaicans are bold about every other thing. So there are certain things that are, they are not that bold and culture is one. Embrace it. This is who you, when you went, went to UNESCO to go and fight for reggae to be a, a, an intangible of them, I could see our dear lady, uh, uh, the Minister of Culture, you know, Babsi, fighting for it. And that's the drill. And this is the same thing we need to do. We need to bring out the culture. It's not lost, it's there. It was, it just had gathered some dust. Let's dust it out and move it. So I've seen a lot of change for the three years I was there and more can be done. It just needs, the momentum needs to continue. I want to go down the fashion road with you because you mentioned that we can identify different regions by the fabric and the print and the so on. And earlier we spoke about people saying, but I don't have any occasion to wear this. So I wonder if you could educate us about the fact that different head ties mean different things, that I could dress in my status as a grandmother or as an aunt, so that we see that there are myriad of occasions that we can possess confidently this identity. I'm laughing because Brother Vivian has changed. <laughs> He Very has been chastised to come out as himself. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Vivian. Thank you so much. This is, this is what I want to see. Um, I don't think you need an occasion to showcase your culture. You do not need an occasion. Your culture, your tradition is who you are, is part of you every day. I'm in the office and I'm wearing the prints. It's not tie and dye, this is a print. And this is an office. Uh, just that you cannot see the whole, the whole picture. There are, this is the way you design that will determine where you wear it to. That is the key aspect. So again, your individuality comes into play. The function where you are going to, if I'm going for a wedding, oh boy, oh, everything is, up for the giving because my hair tie will be pam not as not as very simple as uh, her excellency maureen has just done because maureen has downtoned it for an office she doesn't want to be you know you know too loud so that you don't you don't think uh, that uh, she is not serious so she's you know very corporate this is corporate way but if i if, if she were going for you could have seen i saw her pictures when she presented wow she was you know, there, the head tie to match with the blouse. And she did something very unique. She was also carrying the afefe, which uh, is uh, made from animal skin. And I was so impressed. I know I was like, that is a full cultural attire, complete. There was nothing missing in it. So that was one event. That's to show you that the, the respect she has for Jamaica, presenting her letters of credence to the governor general. This is the highest, where else? And then she came out looking gorgeous, like a queen that she's supp supposed to be. And that's it. And this is her top of the top, like we say in Nigeria, bottom box. You know, you, you, you go deep, you go under the box and bring out your best. You are, I'm going to see the governor general. I'm representing my country. So that's the way it is. So um, we need to look at it. It's even with the English way. You don't take a ballroom dress and go to work. So it's the same thing. So you take, you take the, the fabric, you sew what you want to wear, to go to work, what you want to wear to go to the beach. And I totally agree also with uh, Her Excellency uh, Maureen is that you can even use the tie and dye to make beach wear. 
I saw that uh, in uh, Port Royal with uh, the the volunteer, well, the those who took the training from uh, the volunteers. And what came out was they had beach wear, uh, the ones you can just slink over. You know, you know, you go to the hotel. They say, oh, you can't come in with your swimsuit. So they they made all these light ones that you just throw over your swimsuit and you can walk into the. Uh, the hotel um, reception or dining room. And that was so nice. And a lot of tourists were picking it up. So there are things you can do for tourists, but you have to first and foremost embrace yourself, your identity before you can sell it. And I think that is the key we need to embrace. So yes, there, 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 there are designs for every event. It all depends on you. And I can tell you, even in the office, I see some people, when they come in, I'm like, oh boy, I can't wear this to the office. It's so elaborate. But that's the way the person feels. Miss mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Valerie, who do we need to convince? And what do we need to convince them with? I know that in this society, it's the bottom line. How does this affect the GDP? <laughs> well, we you can start out about the laughter. <laughs> now over there, it is the right laughter. The thing is this, that this is a movement, as yeah. both ambassadors have said. It is a movement, and it takes all of us to push that stone. We would say in JBDC, the hot molasses of the hill. We have to take that commitment and do it. For me and for JBDC, nothing is impossible. We started this organization with no budget of consequence. And all right, we still have no budget, but we have gone pretty we far. Have consequence. We and have yes. no budget, but we have consequence. We have consequence. <laughs> yes. We have presence. Yes. So I think that as a group, which includes the designers, the entrepreneurs, and us here participating in the program, we have to start that movement on a strong footing. It means that we have to emancipate ourselves, all of us, from the kind of, bar, I call it the, the burglar bars that are around us. We have to break that loose and we have to come forward. We have to wear our designs. It's not about selling a piece of fabric. We as the designer also have to present it with pride. I mean, you yes. and me know, this is how we feel beautiful when we have our costume on. Mm -hmm. And it's not a costume in the sense of a play. It's part of us, mm -hmm. you know? And Vivian, that goes without saying. But we have to be the movement. And trust me, when we make the inroads, listen, when people see something good, then we'll come after it, right? Absolutely. We have to tell that story in the fullness of it. We do have our ambassadors, our emissaries already in the system. So we need to just work to strengthen that and move it out. We are not people with all consequence ourselves. We have broken that barrier, even mentally. You know, our maroon friend, Vivian, he broke it long time. But we need to strengthen that. But most of all, we need to build the roots. We right. need to make sure the ecosystem is there so that while we work with that, the system is there to support. Fertilize, fertilize and make it grow. And in and that I, ecosystem, I see so many ministries. We were talking about yes. join up government. We have identified yes. the Ministry of Culture, the Ministry of Education, yes. the Ministry of Industry and Commerce, the Ministry yes. of Job Creation, the Ministry of yes. Finance. It's critical. Transport as well. Well, and finance, definitely. Finance. Yes. I'm a girl who knows you need that fertilizer, strong job. But you wouldn't think transport. But remember, all the ports fall under. Transport. So we have ensured that within that policy, that transport is part, Ministry of Transport, because they are in charge of all the ports of entry into Jamaica. And we need to see our things there, whichever port, whether it's cruise ship, come or plane, come, piano, come, whatever. We need to be there. So they are a part of the network. JBDC is a national network broker for the MSMEs. And this is, this is what we do. This is our reason for being, and we take it very seriously. You better write this down. Somebody is saying that GDP for us means the great dressing project. 
So, <laughs> I love it. I love it. I'm sure Dr. Chap. That was Collins. Collins. That was Collins. Trust Collins. He doesn't talk much, but that's Collins. <laughs> All right, that is and that, that will be put in a letter to the Minister of Finance. Yes. Yeah. And, yes. And, and, and someone who is very concerned that um, the young people are involved is also envisioning um, a competition for design amongst our students or with our four yeah. our students. Yes. Um, I know that we're not starting from scratch value. No. Um, outside of the discussions that you have initiated since um, the start of this festival of the cloth, what, what else exists as basic um, infrastructure for a policy, if I can say that, infrastructure of the policy on which we can build? Well, the truth is that just about to be announced, I am told by our ministry, Ministry of Industry, is a council and we, we know the network we have just spoken about will be represented there. That's very important because again, they go back into their organization, their ministries with a message, right? And, and we expect commitment to make sure that it goes forward into the things we're talking about. So that is there. But I also am of the view that we need to work right back into the educational system, as I said earlier, because it cannot continue to be something that is imposed on top of something. It has to be a part, a genuine part of what we do, how we do, and the embracing of who we are, the pride, the building and strengthening of that pride in our culture and our, our creative industries. You know? so, so it's important. We have to do that and stop trying to impose it later on as exam, you know, a course, a course. No, it has to be really from base. That's to be the homes. We have to be the homes and make people understand that it's not a festival item. It's an everyday experience that we should be working on. And not only that, experiencing and celebrating. It's not something that we should have to try so hard to embrace because it is what we do and how we do. That's why we say Adiri Nayaba, the stew and the art from our Nigeria roots and the Yaba of Jamaica, how we bring those experiences together at the table, because most of us, Jamaica, food is our table, we meet at the table, right? And this is saying, it has to be our normal diet. It can't be that them take the photo because we dress up in our nice head tie and stuff is me. It has to be, that is my regular thing. And because the celebration of the practitioners, Mr. Crawford. Yes. I want you, I want you to take this one so that we can all see how you have changed into yourself. The celebration, the celebration of the practitioners, Adira in the Yaba, Malu, for example, who worked um making Yaba for every possible occasion. How do we celebrate those practitioners? that allow us to have this wonderful title for this, for this presentation. Really? Where are you, Mr. Crawford? Yes, I'm saying yes. though, yes. If, if you are having a banquet, if you were having a banquet, the Yaba would not be on the table. No. We would be using chalk plate. So <laughs> if it is a way of life, if it is a way of life, it should get the recognition that it deserves. That's and if right. you were to wait a, a little longer, I would go into my official outfit. Yeah. I don't want to offend anyone. <laughs> I would be complete with my kaku. <laughs> my kaku bush. You wouldn't be able to identify me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I love the theme. I love what our ambassadors, our commissioners say, that it's about time we recognize ourselves for who we are and not being imitators. Because mm -hmm. imitate, we are not, we are a copy of the real thing, God forbid. Oy. <laughs> the title of the presentation, though, um, speaks to a level of technological and ecological appropriateness. 
And I would like us to explore that in the next few um, remaining minutes before we close. We spoke about the destruction of the trees. To what extent um, would a project like this, Valerie, um, Your Excellency Maureen, to what extent would a project like this benefit from the information we already have about its link to the environment and how it complements and sustains rather than destroys? Well, um, we've had, like I would like to say that we need to add, if we're able to properly harness what we have on ground, we will definitely, um, it, will, it will go a long way to benefiting us in terms of um, improve on our economy, the economy for both nations. Um, if we're able to harness um, and bring about the, um, the, the, the dream that um, JBDC has, will also reduce unemployment. You know, a lot of people are out there, you know, looking for what to do. It's a chain reaction in the production of tire and dye. You have a lot of people involved, designers, a lot of people doing a lot of things. So it will even reduce the unemployment rate and bring about, you know, bring a, a, you know, a stop to restiveness if, if, it's, if it's also part of what you face in Jamaica. It will also create opportunity for self-reliance, creativity, and of course, innovation, not just textile production, but in all areas of fashion. Because when you produce the batik or the tie and dye, it doesn't end just in that process. There will be other people that will, there's a chain reaction, the tailors will have something to do, fashion designers will have something to do, the retail seller, the wholesale seller. There'll be a lot of chain reaction and of course, all this will lead to activity which will boost the economy. And of course, it will, it will encourage tourists to travel when people know that if they come to Jamaica, if they go to Montego Bay or to any site, they'll find something to wear. Like I was speaking yesterday to the foreign affairs uh, minister, I said to her, Jamaica is a beautiful place. It is a destination because what we know Jamaica for is tourism. And I want to believe that in my time, we will know Jamaica for the destination. Not just a destination where people will come to rest along the beaches and relax, but it will be the destination because they will come to rest, they will come to buy the fabrics and other things that we, we're not even talking about. And they'll also come to do business. They'll come to chase what they need to sell somewhere else. And then of course, like my sister has already said, create identity for Jamaican fabrics. It is very important for us to create identity. Let people know us for something in terms of fashion, in terms of fabric. Like, you know, in Nigeria, if you think of any Nigerian, you're looking out to see what a Nigerian is wearing. When they say Nigerian is coming, you're looking, ah, let's watch out to see what this Nigerian will be wearing. We have an identity. And so that will be what I would suggest. My sister has already said. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Valerie, the role of the craft markets and the craft vendors in this who obviously take pride in, in, in making and selling things Jamaican. You can't walk into a craft market anywhere in Jamaica and not see our colors, whether it's Independence or Easter or Christmas or whatever the season is. They take great pride in selling Jamaican, Jamaican identity products. How do they fit into this vision? Well, First of all, a couple of years ago, we had actually done about 35 plans for the markets in Jamaica. And part of that effort was to see a kind of elevation of the market so that it becomes a place that you really look forward to spending time in. We have allowed those markets to, to deteriorate in terms of structures and so on. 
And if you're going to be trying to engender pride in what we do, then the frame, the house, have a look, inviting and good. We also had suggested then that we do some theming of, that's a big part of theming the market. So that each market does have or started out with a specific theme so that those products in that market would have a history that, that speaks to that market. So a buyer, which is not necessarily a tourist in the traditional sense, but whoever, I say purchaser, would visit every market and still be able to buy something because each market would have its own story to be telling a different story. I think we need to get back to that. And also we um, would like to see some more business training so that it is not a hustle. It's not something you do because things now are gone. So you're gonna try and see if something happened today. It has to be with a purpose that you're going to your business place. It means you're going to operate in a certain way and that the structure needs to be developed to provide the kind of support that would be required. And that the, the products are at international standards. Standards become critical. They must be at international standards. So when anybody purchases, whether it's local or external, it speaks with pride what it's supposed to be representing. That's important for a JBDC. In terms of the, the, the way forward, and as her excellency just spoke, we know that we like to see things, seeing is believing in Jamaica. And one of the things I think we need to do as JBDC now is to develop the map so that when we go to our lead people, people who can impact the development, that it is, it is stable, it's mapped out what the industry is about, where it fits into the bigger industry picture, what are the elements in that chain, so that we talk about the agricultural part, show how important the connectivity is for each component, demonstrate the business opportunities, so that can contribute to GDP. In other words, present it in a way that it tells the full story for whoever. So if it's the Minister of Finance, you need to see that there is a place in the system for this to contribute. And everybody along the way, all the network broking that we broker and that we do, that each piece understands where they fit into this puzzle. And one piece can be missing it in our other puzzle. So each piece of the puzzle needs to be there so we can get the full picture working for everybody. And this is what we have done that, as you know, for the creative industries in general, but this is the one element that needs to be, each one of them needs to have a specific picture drawn of the actions and the actors and how they work together to deliver on the whole business of development. In the end, we're talking about development. Not just a nice concept, it's about development, economic development that comes from our cultural raw material. And timing is so critical. critical you miss critical. a step, you miss time. Because if we had that proposal, for the craft markets already in place, then we yeah. would have been so many steps ahead. So one right. of the things I would like the panelists to think about, because I'm going to come to each of you in a little while and ask you, give us one must do, or if you have two, must do right now after we leave this forum, must do as part of the way forward. But I'm not yet finished with you, Ms. Val, because so far we have identified elements of the policy as having to do with how the material is produced. And we have spoken to the business of the involvement of the Ministry of Agriculture. We have looked at edu so production, education, training, design, manufacturing. What about export? And what about the role of the diaspora uh, in helping us to advance this way forward? Any thoughts I on that? Yes, well, for us, export starts here. It starts here. And that's why I original, earlier I spoke about quality. Because 
is not only export capital quality, but that's an important part of the whole system. We must be presenting to the marketplace quality products. That's, a, that's, that's very important. And uh, the, that's why we say we work as a broker, because we have customs, we have the trade board, we have Jampro, which is part of our network. Because things coming in, we will always have to bring in something. So customs is always going to be relevant. How do we treat with supplies coming in, for instance, and then products going out? So it's important even customs trade board and of course jumping as our promotion agencies. But in terms of Ministry of Transport, remember we have our things Jamaican shops. And the ports of entry, we expect to have a shop in every port. That is an export market. That's a market that we can use to start the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. And then uh, for sure the diaspora. But you see, if we at home here is not to remember, if we at home not embracing with pride, then we might not get them to understand how important it is for them to represent us in the way we want to be represented. So it starts here, but of course we need to reach out to the diaspora, who's always hungry, you know, for things from back a yard. Mm -hmm. But we need to be always presenting the package as a quality product and as a real, not a copy product, not a fake product, but a real genuine product that speaks to our history and our culture. Well, she just question, Miss Val, and you need not answer it. But you have about 3,000 people working at JBDC to do the 40 million things that you just tell us that you're doing, supposed to do and want to do. Yes, yes. Well, I have a, a team that is overworked, underpaid. So I do have 123 overworked people. But we're committed to the development of Jamaica. And in fact, we like what we are asking the entrepreneurs to do. We have created some elasticity in our organization. So we have surrounding us experts, technologists, we have business service providers. These are pools of and networks of mostly small business that we pull on as we need. So it's a very elastic organization. We always are out there stretching. So yeah, we don't have three, we might go to the three million, but at the moment, the one, the 123 plus, our encircling of our, um, our, our networks helps us to move forward. And of course, in co collaborating with the other ministries and so that we have spoken about, how we develop the teamwork. That is, is Jamaica, one team, one Jamaica. We just get paid out of one ministry, but we work for Jamaica because the Jamaican taxpayers that pay us, you know? So we are committed. And I really am a lucky CEO because I do have staff that are committed to the process and never get weary yet no, they get weary but we just give them little goat belly soup and, <laughs> and we laugh and chat and so on some are dairy right i think that equals stew we eat the stew and we sing and laugh and i will come back and put the yabba on the, and put, and put, the the yabba yabba. On the, put the yabba on the table in the middle of the table in middle the middle of the table, table. yes must do. must do your excellency janet must do what would you say that we must do after this? Uh, for me, our leaders must change their mindset. They must lead by example. They must lead the way. That for me is must do. Because as much as we all can talk, if they don't put the enabling environment for Ms. V to do what she needs to do, lead by example, by showcasing all that, you know, the, the, we are bringing out, so that it is good to wear. And it's not just a tie and dye. It's, it's, we have all the things that are done, the food industry, for example. You have a whole lot, it's not, you have so much, but you're only showcasing a few. Yam, for example, you don't use yam to the fullest. There's so much you can do with yam. And you know, make yam yam flour and, and and sell to the US to the diaspora from Africa, for example, because what we are sending sending from here is not enough. And they are hungry, and you have yam. 
but you export yam in a way that before you know it, it perishes. But if you put it into yam flour, that's it. You've created an industry. So these are all the things that JBDC is doing. So you, you have a whole lot. So leaders must lead by example. They must change and pave the way. That's it. Thank you. Must do, Your Excellency Maureen, must do. Is she still with us? Yes, she is. Yes. I know that you gave us okay, a so list of things must earlier. Do. Ah, yes. You can you hear me? Yes, I'm hearing you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we're you hearing you. Please go ahead. It's um, encouraging, it's encouraging cottage industries to be set, to be set out around country. That is availability of what we're talking about being in strategic places and also documentation. That way we will not lose knowledge of what we already know. That is my most. Thank you very much. Mr. Crawford, must do. What must we do? We have the role must of leadership, do. we have cottage industries and documentation. Well, must do and it has been a longing since 1066 that our national fabric material design the bandana must be embraced by all jamaicans i would like to be wearing a bandana shirt to work it's a must do and it has not been embraced by all jamaicans so it's a must do it's a movement to embrace all jamaicans when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Thank you. Can you imagine the Jamaica Olympic team arriving in Tokyo representing the Adira in the Yaba? It's not too late. It's not too late. Take the world by it's not too late. Yaba. I dearly say, show our friend. It's not too late for Ayaba. No, it's not too oh, late. Miss V is a magician. Miss V is a magician. She can make it happen. It's not too late. And 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 every so often there's a race that the award ceremony happens on Jamaica Independence Day. And when we win that race and we take the podium with we Adira in the Yaba, it's not too late. We can do it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so very much. I have been so stimulated. Mr. Harold Davis, what you have to say? Come, Minister, come. We got so much things to say <laughs> right now. <laughs> yes, Harold, how are you? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> this has been an exciting time for us. This has been an exciting time. And I'm sorry, and let me not apologize from now. I'm in a Hannah cupboard in the, in the back of the office. We got change, like Vivian did. <laughs> but not to worry, not to worry. I'm, I'm sporting my, my pink today. <laughs> but truly, this has been a fascinating um, journey for us. I want to thank um, Her Excellency, Dr. Maureen um, Tam Tam Tamuno, right? <laughs> uh, so for well and welcome, by the way, we need to, Mr. Alpha, Ms. V, need to come sit down with you. Um, H.E. Janet, wow, it's so good to see you. A long, long time when I see you. <laughs> um, Janet is, is officially a JBDC um, executive. <laughs> Not only is she Jamaican fully, but she's officially a JBDC executive. But my, 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 my maroon friend Vivian, and by the way, Vivian is a, an as astute musician as well. Many of you, I don't know if everybody knows. Uh, yes, man. Okay. Yes, that we have in, in Jamaica where that is concerned again. But not only that, Vivian is such a wealth of he's a walking encyclopedia where Jamaican history is concerned. Um, and we were so excited, Vivian, um, to have you today. Um, um, on short notice, but I mean. We love you and, and we love the work that you do and we love what you do for Jamaica. It has it's so it's so important, Vivian. And and, and I want to celebrate you um, in, in my comments here and continue to celebrate uh, what you bring to us as Jamaicans. Um, um, 
in, in, in this time. Um, Dr. Amina, Lord of mercy. What, a, what, what we couldn't have had a better weaver <laughs> to work with us um, through, through these three weeks. Um, she has just woven the fabric of, of, of this richness that we have um, experienced in the last three weeks. But herself, she herself is also a treasure um, that we celebrate in Jamaica. She is a storyteller and, what the, and the stories that she tells is those that invoke a consciousness of our people. That is a remarkable. And we, and we celebrate you, Amina. We love you. And thank you so much for being here. Ms. V, you know, so you are the one. I are the one. <laughs> <laughs> and we continue to celebrate Ms. V and, and her wealth of knowledge and, and her leadership for, of, of us at JBDC here for 20 years. For 20 years. By the way, we're celebrating our 20th year this year. I must tell her no, big things are going on in our July <laughs> for JBDC. But um, this Festival of the Cloth has been a fantastic experience. The first week we spoke about the context. Um, the second week we went on to talk about how we leverage that context with a Jamaican brand. And this third week culminating Adira and Amiaba, the sustainability model we spoke about. It is about entrepreneurship. It is about building an industry. That's how we see it. It is about building an industry, connecting the dots in this cultural and, and, and creative industry, a larger group. But building an industry we recognize is about finding the model that works for Jamaica. Um, we learn from our, from, from our brothers and sisters in, in Nigeria, but we have now to find that model that works for us in Jamaica. It's very important. Um, we, we, we need to be talking about when we're building an industry, we need to talk about, Ms. V spoke about it, raw material supply and managing that and understanding how that works. Fabric, um, agriculture, back to the economic model that works for us as from, for our supply side. We need to also, uh, H.E. Um, Marine spoke about the need to stimulate market demand is very, very important in building an industry. And that might include some market education as well. And yes, we get it, GDP for real, don't it? <laughs> Great dressing project. And maybe we should, that suggestion about um, uh, having our leaders lead by, 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 by being dressed in this way is a, is a fabulous way to stimulate a market demand. It's very, very important. And then, of course, we have to be talking about the manufacturing itself, the skills, those skills that Aloha um, has worked with us for the last few years as, and, and as, and as Janet says, it's not about introducing, it's about reintroducing <laughs> to, to, to Jamaican space, but those skills are important. But bringing those elements of the ecosystem together is important in the whole business of building an industry. And we recognize that as JDDC, and we understand that. So we understand that it's all about work for them, all about work for them, for connect everybody in ICM, um, for have everybody eating out of the same yabba, first of all thinking the same way and conceptualizing this industry is very important. Finally, this is about economic and social wealth. It's not about, Ms. V said it, it's not just about doing a thing and, and feeling good about an excitement, a, exciting occasion. It is about creating economic wealth and also social wealth, I think is so important yeah? um, as, as well. It is about who we are, as everybody has said on the panel today, is about who we are, is about celebrating, strengthening and leveraging the best of what is good about us. Yeah? The best about our rich history, which we're hoping to make sure that it converts into heritage. Vivian teach me last week the difference between history <laughs> and heritage. Heritage is about what you bring from your history now, <laughs> you know, and utilize now in your, and history is, 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 is what go on, is what go on. We need not so much to be influenced sometimes by our Western, Westernization of, of what it is that we are, but if we embrace our roots and who we are and understand who we are, then the journey would have begun. I want to close by saying that JBDC is committed to staying the course. We are here for the long haul. We are here to make sure that this thing happen, right? 
And by the way, we have something exciting that's going to be happening with the Miss Jamaica World contestants very soon. That I know Miss V never remember, but but we have it. Well, I, I don't want I don't want to preempt it too much, but something exciting will happen where, 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 where the promotion of our local designers and our local fabrics are concerned. So watch this space. So thank you so much for being here, our presenters, for three weeks. We had some fabulous presenters and panelists um, to share this experience with us. And finally, thank you to our participants for being here, for being a part of this journey that we have embarked on, being a part of this movement as Ms. V um, speaks of it. That's what we need. We need committed, excited, energized persons to stir the pot, to lead. That is when, 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 that is when we'll have other persons catching the fire. We have to be that flame that persons will catch the fire from. And we are committed to that. We are committed to steer the course and making it happen. Finally, thank you, Sancia and the communications team. Thank you, uh, the team from Colin, Colin Porter and the technical services um, team. Um, they, all the JBDC support, the IT support for making this happen. This has been a fabulous, fabulous three weeks. And we're not done it with just a come. We just a come. We just a get started. <laughs> just yeah, a just a come. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, David, David, big up. And oh, one more thing, Sansa, tell me, tell me, tell me, I'll tell you. The regard, <laughs> we get so excited, but forget. The recordings are available on YouTube. <laughs> okay, don't forget that. The recordings are available on YouTube. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a blessed day with Janet. So good to see you. <laughs> you need to come back to Jamaica soon. <laughs> All right. Have a good day, everybody. Blessings. Mm -hmm.